Although the arid Sahara Desert may lay claim to most of northern Africa, the region just to the south is land of varying climates, terrains, and peoples. It is filled with government instability, jobs that are difficult to find, and basic needs that may not even be able to be met. Sub-Saharan Africa is faced with varying issues, which we're going to delve into today. Issues like migration, trade warfare, monetary policy, development, and even terrorism. Join me as we delve into the world of Sub-Saharan Africa. There is a major migration crisis in Sub-Saharan Africa, where millions of people are risking their lives in recent years to reach Europe. An overwhelming majority of those who go to sea across the Mediterranean come from Nigeria, Senegal, Ivory Coast, and Guinea. Nigeria is the region's largest economy, but has been plagued with violence due to terrorism, which causes millions of people, many of them under the age of 18, to flee their homes as refugees, searching for safety in other countries. Climate change and desertification also play a major role for the migration in this area. An important example of this is Lake Chad. It has shrunk by 90% in the past 60 years. Nearly 25 million people in four different countries, including Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, and Niger, depend on this body of water. This is causing people to have to leave and search for a more stable living environment. This map here shows that almost 1.7 million people emigrated as refugees from their homes in Nigeria in just 2017 alone. And this graph here shows that the average number of people in thousands migrating to and from Nigeria, spanning between the years of 1962 to 2017. With such an overwhelming amount of refugees, we have to wonder what is causing the more recent surges in numbers. French President Emmanuel Macron states that these countries are doing just as well as they were 10 years ago, that the increase of numbers is due to a youth who believe there is no hope in their countries. Since early time in human history, the Horn of Africa has played a key role in global trade. In its early years, it was the farthest extent of Roman trade with outposts in the Red Sea serving as a presence of Roman influence in the region. During the medieval era, nothing changed as it was a hub instead of Arabic and Christian trade. And today, it remains much the same. Over 4.8 million barrels of crude oil travel through the region on a daily basis. And thanks to the Suez Canal, over $1 trillion in goods traverse through the region every year. Over time, the region's main trade partners have transitioned from the United States and European powers to the People's Republic of China. Chinese trade in the region has seen an increase from a low billions in the early 2000s and late 90s to hundreds of billions of dollars in goods each year between the People's Republic of China and countries in the Horn of Africa such as Ethiopia and Eritrea and Somalia. Nowadays, the People's Republic of China is the number one trade partner of Eritrea and is close to supplanting the U.S. as the number one trade partner of Ethiopia. This growing Chinese trade influence in the region represents a persistent Chinese effort to combat U.S. influence and hold on regions of the globe and is one that the U.S. must address with its own trade warfare if it seeks to maintain the balance of power between itself and China. Development in South Africa has been climbing at a faster rate than most of Sub-Saharan Africa, especially since the 1990s. Infrastructure as well as economic stability are on the up and up, but still have a long way to go earning the status of developed. From 1948 to the mid-1990s, a suffocating apartheid was in place in South Africa, harshly discriminating against people of color and creating many unequal economic opportunities. Since the abolishment of the apartheid, development has exponentially increased with the aid of the Southern African Development Community. This organization helps organize policy in the Southern African region, significantly benefiting the South African economy as well as that of many other countries. With the newly established openness of free trade between countries as well as the establishment of a uniform currency, the South has become better unified through trade which has overall benefited the economy of South Africa which has in turn led 
stimulated substantial development of infrastructure, primarily in centralized transportation, as well as localized electricity. With public access to water as well as substantial housing and technological advancements being behind schedule, there's a long way to go for South Africa to be moved into the developed country list. However, they're making progress each year and are well on their way to meeting development standards. Central banks in the sub-Saharan region face a daunting task. Economic and governmental instability have gripped the region, and COVID-19 has only made things worse. COVID-19 was already affecting African economies even before the virus reached Africa's shores. Zimbabwe still faces crises of inflation. Somalia faces a turn from projected growth to projected regression of the same magnitude. South Africa is home to one of the largest income inequalities globally. Central banks must juggle maintaining whatever economic growth they can muster while preventing inflation from running amok. Luckily for the Sub-Sahara, international organizations like the World Bank and International Monetary Fund are mobilizing to assist countries in need. The IMF has eliminated interest rates on their concessional loans. The World Bank loaned over $40 billion worldwide during a five-month period. Some experts fear that international banking organizations may not be able to provide enough assistance to prevent an economic downward spiral for the Sub-Sahara. Africa needs debt relief to enable the continent to focus on its economic recovery. We, we should support international partner efforts to enact an across-the-board debt standstill for African countries. The region is poised for massive population growth over the upcoming years. And almost poetically, COVID-19 is poised to destroy the region's potential for economic prosperity. It is yet to be determined if outside assistance will be enough to prevent a fall toward instability. But the central banks of sub-Saharan Africa are not alone in their missions. For terrorism in sub-Saharan Africa, there are two prominent militant groups in Nigeria and Somalia known as Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab. Both terrorist organizations have been a regional concern due to events of suicide bombing, kidnapping, theft, and street violence, just to name a few. The death toll numbers have reached the 10,000s, looking at statistics from just 2019, and the death rates only rise as both groups are still active in the region. The first group, Boko Haram, is an insurgent group mostly located in Nigeria that is based in the Sunni Islamic religion. They are known for their 2014 attack on the Chaibok Girls School. They kidnapped over 200 girls and as of 2018 have only recovered approximately 100. The second group, Al-Shabaab, is a terrorist organization in Somalia that has close ties with Al-Qaeda. Their attacks are mostly based on taking control of Somalia and forcing their interpretation of Sharia law. These groups, like many terrorist organizations, form due to displeased individuals with the government. While both groups' motives and actions are not identical, they are very similar. The corruption and un-Islamic nature of the government in Sub-Saharan Africa is the main driver behind the establishment of these terrorist groups, along with many others. The Western ideals are what they are fighting by initiating acts of violence on the Nigerian and Somalian government, as well as their people. As we've seen today, Sub-Saharan Africa is in a precarious position. But with careful government leadership and clever policy, the region may be able to develop into one the likes of which we have never seen on the planet. Thank you. It's, re it's really cold cut.